Swedish University of Fresno in 2015. Currently, he is pursuing his master's degree at the same institution. He was awarded a Kalust Gulbenkian short-term grant for Armenian studies to travel to London for his research on his great-great-grandfather, Thomas Lugutichian, and Armenians in British intelligence during World War I. He is currently the editor of High Sharjum, the Armenian student newspaper at CSU Fresno. The title of his presentation today is Armenians in the British Intelligence Service during World War I, a case study of Thomas Lugutichian and Arshag Safrastian. Thank you, Dr. Curry, for the introduction, and thank you to ARPA for having me. I will be presenting on Armenians in British Intelligence, a case study of Thomas Magritchian. In November of 1914, an Armenian living in the Ottoman Empire found himself fleeing his homeland at the outbreak of World War I. Talat Pasha, the Minister of the Interior, had sent orders to execute Thomas Magritchian for allegedly spying on behalf of the Entente powers. In the following months, the Armenian population of the Ottoman Empire would be marked for annihilation under the cover of war. Mogherichin was specifically targeted for his service to the British Empire as a dragoman, or a liaison between Europe and the Middle East, and as the vice consul of Diyarbakir. Armenians employed by British consulates played important roles in collecting intelligence in the Ottoman Empire before the war and were similarly important as intelligence officers and interpreters during the war. In special cases, dragomen such as Mogadishian and Archlak Safrastian were left in charge of protecting British interests in their respective provinces as acting vice consuls. So today, for the sake of time, I'm concentrating on Thomas Mogadishian. Uh, part of my larger project, I'm also focusing on Archlak Safrastian, both who are seated uh, Thomas Mogadishian is seated, um, seated to the second to the right, and Arshad Safrasian is seated furthest to the right. <clears throat> so this paper is part of my larger thesis, which examines the identities of Armenians in British intelligence mm -hmm. during World War One. The British use of Armenians in the war effort raises interesting questions regarding the ambiguous identities of these Armenians, both how they viewed themselves and how the British viewed them in return. Through the course of this, their careers, Armenians in the service of the Foreign Office, including Mogherichian, were able to assume a British layer to their Ottoman Armenian identities, thus inhabiting a unique middle ground between the Occident and the Orient. Studying the lives of these Armenians provides interesting case studies into how and why they were able to identify as British on the periphery of the empire, and to what extent the British accepted them as such. I contend that British officers who worked in close proximity with Armenian agents were more prone to view the Armenians favorably as opposed to British officers closer to the Metropole who often distrusted Armenian reports. Armenians in the 19th century did not fit comfortably into British conceptions of the East and the West. According to Joanne Laycock in Imagining Armenian Orientalism, Ambiguity, and Intervention, the British saw the Armenians as, quote, special and worthy, end quote, of British attention, but also as, quote, different and often savage. They were not fully Eastern or Western, but something in between. While the British public admired ancient Armenian civilization and respected her Christian heritage, they could not reconcile this image with that of the contemporary Armenian farmers, who were often considered indistinguishable from the local Turks and Kurds. British travelers criticized Armenian farmers for living under the same roof as their livestock and for their general lack of cleanliness. They were also critical of the, quote, greedy and unscrupulous Armenian merchants, end quote. 
However, they simultaneously admired Armenians for defending their Christian faith, going so far as to label Armenia as a, quote, advanced post of European civilization, end quote. The British reconciled these contradictory ideals by claiming that the Armenians were a civilized race but had degenerated by living under Eastern oppression. According to Laycock, the British manipulated the ambiguous identities, the ambiguous nature of Armenian identity to their benefit by framing the war as a morally just effort against the Ottomans to save fellow Christians. However, she points out that the British were quick to abandon their promises to the Armenians after the war. Laycock attributes this abandonment to the fact that the Armenians were on the quote, physical and cultural fringe of the British Empire and thus easy to forget, end quote. However, she does not adequately address the agency Armenians displayed in manipulating their own identities to advocate for both Armenian and British interests in the region. The British Empire hoped to bolster the Ottoman Empire. To, with the, these were their interests in the Ottoman Empire. It was to bolster the empire against Russian ambitions and to pacify their own Muslim subjects in the British Empire. The British were wary of their own Muslim subjects after the Indian Rebellion of 1857, in which Hindu and Muslim Indians revolted against the British East India Company because of religious tensions. Although the rebellion began with Hindu soldiers, the British largely held, largely held the Muslims responsible for escalating the conflict. They feared and distrusted Muslims after 1857 as a result of this. They initially reacted by suppressing uh, the Muslim subjects in the British Empire with a series of violent killings, arrests, and fines. However, the British feared that a union of Hindu and Muslim forces could dismantle the Raj and that the only way to prevent this was to diminish the religious tensions. They were also concerned with protecting their position in Egypt because of the Suez Canal and its importance in communicating with and supplying British India. The British saw friendship with the Sultan of the Ottoman Empire, who was a spiritual leader of the Islamic world at that time, as a way to placate their Muslim subjects. An alliance with the Ottoman Caliph would give the British credibility with Muslims around the world. On the other hand, they feared that if Turkey were to join the Central Powers against the Allies, the Turks would incite the Muslim population of the British Empire to rebel. These fears and the potential to have greater influence in Turkey were the, re the reasons that the British government established the consulates in eastern provinces of the Ottoman Empire. The demography of the Ottoman Empire was very complex, with a wide variety of ethnic and religious groups residing within its borders. Because of this, the British consulates throughout the empire employed local agents as dragomen. It was important for these dragomen to understand the customs, languages, and practices of the locals to be better suited for gathering intelligence. In 1896, Vice Consul Hallward of Diyarbakir requested the right to hire Mavridichin as his dragoman because it was difficult to hold direct communications with the locals, and he emphasized that it was not just um, the need to have a Turkish translator, but it was the need to have an actual local to relate with the people on the ground and to be able to sit down for four hours with them in their home and extract information. So it, he needed more than just a traveler or a translator, which a British agent could have done. Um, so in 1896, he requested Marguerite Chin. However, the Foreign Office was opposed to taking on such, quote, protégés in the country. Howard insisted on the necessity of a native dragoman to keep the consulate informed. Thomas Marguerite Chin was uniquely fit to become such an informant. Marguerite Chin was raised in a kurdo armenian tribe in Rudvon and became fluent in several local languages at an early age. He graduated from the Euphrates College Seminary Theological School in 1890 and spent the next six years as a Protestant minister of several Armenian churches throughout the province of Diyarbakir. Marguerite Chin first became involved with the British consulate in 1896 when he helped distribute British and American relief funds for the Armenian victims of the 1895 massacres. Howard then employed Mugridi Chin 
as his dragoman because he was the, quote, only man who could speak English, Turkish, Armenian, and Kurdish, end quote. His status as a Protestant minister similarly contributed to his candidacy, candidacy for the position as the British considered Protestant Armenians to be more civilized than their Orthodox brethren. The exchange between Vice Consul Hallward and the Foreign Office regarding Margarichian demonstrates the divide that was forming between practical needs on the ground and Orientalist, Orientalist attitudes in the Metropole. Howard understood that Mugridichian had useful skills and could collect intelligence better than a British officer, while the Foreign Office viewed him more as a liability. As a dragoman, Mugridichian traveled to different Ottoman provinces to, quote, gather information for the British government concerning the topography, population, economy, agriculture, industry, and military might of the country. He wrote several reports for British intelligence, including information on the exports and imports of the Arbukir, a summary of the Young Turks Party activity in Egypt, and information <coughs> excuse me, on the Arabic, Kurdish, and Armenian tribes in the Ottoman Empire. In addition to providing intelligence, the British used Mabridi Chin to intercede on behalf of Armenians and missionaries who were arrested on false pretenses for their efforts to distribute relief to Armenian victims of the 1895 massacres. Mogadishian's work brought him into frequent, frequent contact with Turkish and European dignitaries. He manipulated his appearance depending on who he was meeting by wearing the fez in the presence of Turkish dignitaries and wearing English suits when meeting with European dignitaries. Mogadishian knew the importance of appearing Turkish to the Turks British to the Europeans, and Kurdish to the Kurds. Mogadishian often hosted European dig dignitaries and travelers, such as Mark Seitz and Gertrude Bell, who preferred to stay at his home rather than the local hotels. In 1910, Mogadishian hosted the German spymaster, Baron von Oppenheim, for one week. Oppenheim was not an official member of the German diplomatic service and had no specific assignment during the war so that the Germans would not be held responsible for his subversive actions against the Allies. This was before the war. He traveled throughout the Middle East, meeting with prominent Turks and Arabs to promote Germany's imperial interest in the Ottoman Empire and to incite a Muslim Jihad against the British Empire. This made Oppenheim especially dangerous uh, to the British because of their tensions with their Muslim subjects. The British knew of Oppenheim's work and called him the, quote, Kaiser's spy. During this visit, Oppenheim offered Mugridi Chin a higher payer, paying salary if he would work for the German intelligence community. Mugridi Chin rejected this offer out of loyalty to the British Empire. His daughter recalls how her father, quote, whined and dined Oppenheim until he became so relaxed that he boasted that Germany would soon conquer Europe and America and would, quote, sit on top of the world, end quote. Mogadishian warned Oppenheim that he would forward these threats to the British government and that the British and Oppenheim replied that since he was of European nobility, the British would not take his word over Oppenheim's. Nevertheless, Mogadishian forwarded his report to the British who reprimanded him for trying to incite trouble between King Edward and his cousin the Kaiser. The Foreign Office valued the word of this spy over that of Mogadishian because, as Laycock demonstrates, Armenians were, quote, unreliable witnesses, according to the British. Despite the distrust of the Foreign Office, Margaret Chin's direct superiors began to value his loyalty and dedication to British service. They wrote on behalf, his behalf to the Foreign Office when Margaret e. Chin applied for pay raises. The vice consuls in Margaret e. Chin's earlier career were more distrustful of him. However, over time, he was entrusted with greater responsibilities. In 1897, Wall, the then vice consul of Diyarbakir, left the French vice consul in charge of British, in British interests in the region because it was, quote, too difficult to trust a native agent without supervision, end quote. Over the years, Mogadishian accumulated greater prestige and credibility among the British consulates in eastern Turkey through his service. 
He was left in charge of the British Consulate in Diyarbakir as the acting vice consul nine times between 1898 and 1914. In 1907, Vice Consul Heard from Beatleys asked for permission to borrow Mavridichin from the consulate in Diyarbakir because Mavridichin knew the best sources of information and Heard had, quote, full confidence in his discretion, end quote. Later that year, Mavridichin applied for a raise in his salary for his 12 years of service. Vice Consul Heard and George Lloyd, who had become the British High, Cons High Commissioner of Cairo, petitioned on Mavridi Chin's behalf. Heard wrote that Mavridi Chin had great influence in the land and was a, quote, perfect mind of information. He similarly argued that Mavridi Chin was, quote, so devoted to British interests that he refused a tempting offers, offer of German employment and nothing would induce him to leave our service, end quote. At the outbreak of World War I, Mavridi Chin successfully fled the Ottoman Empire by once again manipulating his identity when he was arrested en route to Beirut, in Beirut en route to Egypt. Mogadichin spoke in Kurdish to his guard in a quote, sweet manner, end quote, and was able to convince the guard, thinking Mogadichin a fellow Kurd, to set him free. He then fled to Cairo and served as a translator and intelligence officer with the Egyptian Expeditionary Force in Palestine under General Allenby. Unlike the stagnant trench warfare of the Western Front, the Palestinian campaign was more fluid and dynamic. It was a last war in which cavalry proved to be effective. The British had difficulty in community in accumulating and consolidating intelligence for in-depth study because of the fast-paced nature of this Eastern Front. British cavalry units captured hundreds of prisoners, defectors, and documents that needed to be examined. <clears throat> the British solved this problem by attaching intelligence officers and translators who spoke Arabic, Turkish, and English to each of these cavalry units. These translators enabled troops to interrogate prisoners and decipher documents while on the move. They sent the prisoners to the POW Camp Ludd for further interrogation. Mogadi Chin served both with the Australian and New Zealand Mounted Division and at the POW Camp Lead. His fluid identity allowed him to act as a mediator between the British and their Armenian and Arabic allies and prisoners. <clears throat> While his direct supervisors valued Mogadi Chin and his service, the Foreign Office was often more hesitant. Mogadi Chin became a naturalized British citizen after the war and hoped to be reassigned to another post in British intelligence. Once the Foreign Office decided that he was no longer needed after the war, Mogadi Chin petitioned for the pension that he was promised for his 26 years of service. The Foreign Office, however, decided that his case did not justify a pension and rejected this petition. <clears throat> Mogadi Chin petitioned once again with the support of Colonel Deeds and General Allenby who declared that his service had been, quote, uniformly satisfactory, end quote. Margaret Eachin's wife, who was then in America, wrote to Emily Robinson, founder of the Armenian Red Cross and Relief Society in the United Kingdom, claiming that the only thing the British government had against her husband was his Armenian identity. Robinson wrote to the Foreign Office on behalf of Margaret Eachin, <coughs> stressing the importance rewarding those who served the British Empire regardless of their race. The Foreign Office decided that Mugridi Chin did not deserve his yearly pension and would be contented with less. They decided to compound his payment into one lump sum of 100 pounds, quote, with a view to economy, end quote. General Allenby and Colonel Deeds were shocked that his pension was turned down, further demonstrating the differing attitudes between British officers who worked in close proximity with Mavridi Chin and the more distant foreign office. <clears throat> Mavridi Chin moved to Fresno to reunite with his family in 1921, but remained in close contact with British consulates in the United States. He petitioned the British Prime Minister for his pension in 1925, claiming that if he had worked as a merchant or for a firm for 26 years, he would have received some sort of pension, and thus it was only right that he be compensated as a British officer. Despite never receiving his pension, 
Margaret E. Chang continued to advocate for British interests. In 1929, Margaret E. Chang was approached by an Armenian, Greek or Vartanian, on behalf of the Kurdish Independence Society. Vartanian asked Margaret E. Chang to travel to 